Hello and welcome to O Sing Joyfully. My name is Mary Graham and here with me today is Sarah Simcoe. This is part of our hymn series um, that we have started planning, started doing, um, where we talk to members of our congregation about hymns that are important to them. So hello, Sarah. Thank you for being with us. Hello. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, yes, I am the interim associate organist uh, at the cathedral, and in my day job, I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan, and I am also the uh, organ instructor at Madonna University. Yes, she is very smart and wonderful, and we are very lucky to have her. What hymn do you have for us today? I would love to talk about Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Yay! Vision. Yay! We are going to have such a good time with this. Be Thou My Vision is one of my uh, all-time favorite hymns. Uh, it was one of my favorite hymns before I was an organist, um, and it was one of my first bucket list pieces to learn for myself, and it's just um, a very joyful moment anytime I get to accompany it in a service. And um, for those of you that don't know, I was raised Presbyterian, and uh, so Mary Graham and I were talking before we uh, started filming this, and we have some interesting comparisons between Presbyterian and Episcopalian. And just to note, I've worked for the Pre Episcopalians for a long time. <laughs> yeah, this is a very, so let's start with the text, I guess. That, that leads into that really well. Um, I, you have your Presbyterian hymnal. I have my Episcopal hymnal 1982. Um, so according to the hymnal 1982, uh, the words are Irish circa 700, question mark. Um, versified by Mary Elizabeth Byrne, who I believe may have versified them into modern Irish, um, and then translated uh, by Eleanor Hull, uh, who lived at the end of, mid to the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and then the words have been slightly altered, as we Episcopalians are wont to do. Um, Eleanor Hull, uh, in her translation, uh, gave us five verses. Uh, and neither the Presbyterians nor the Episcopalians keep all five of them. Um, the Episcopalians have three verses intact as she translated them. And the Presbyterians have four verses, at least one of which is like a slice of two verses. Yeah. So um, maybe it would be, Sarah, if you want to just read through the hymn, like as a poem, sure. uh, that might be a good starting place. Sure, the Episcopal version. Uh, whichever one you, I mean, do the Presbyterian one, actually, since that's got, that's got more sure. verses. Sure. Um, so this is coming from the 2010 update to the Presbyterian hymnal, which is now called Glory to God. Uh, and they went through and did a lot of editing like this, um, which caused quite a stir when it was released. So this is the 2010 Glory to God uh, versification. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word, I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my soul's shelter, and thou my high tower, raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise, Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, a ruler of all. God, so good, even when it's Frankenstein together. So the verse that has some, some edits, uh, I'm just going to pop over and read. Um, uh, the verse that begins, Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word, uh, in the original continues, I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father, I thy true son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. 
Be thou my battle shield, sword for my fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Um, the Episcopal hymnal does not uh, include Be Thou My Battle Shield, and it does not include the verse that begins, Riches I heed not. Um, we just get three verses. <laughs> They're lovely, <laughs> but it's like three and get out. Um, so I, I think that those changes are very interesting. I, uh, as a general rule, I'm not a fan of taking you know, this part of this verse and this part of that verse, or even flipping them within, this is what, this is not the place for Mary Graham's opinion about Hark the Herald Angels Sing, but we're gonna get it just, just anyway. Uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, as it currently is in the hymnal 1982, contains a couple of instances of, you know, the, it, their eight line verses being split in half and the quatrain switched, and it drives me nuts. Drives me nuts. Um, but that's a, that's a story for another time. Um, but especially considering that this hymn is Irish uh, in basically all ways, uh, I think it's interesting that Be Thou My Battle Shield gets cut because that is a very Irish hymn tradition. You think about St. Patrick's Breastplate, uh, which is like very rhythmic in terms of like arming yourself with God. Um, that's it's a whole genre like it's a uh, lorica is the name for it is the song that you sing when you're putting on your armor um so that's that's just an interesting kind of cultural maybe we didn't trust it to transfer maybe we should have i'm not sure um but uh what draws you to this hymn i mean like i think we both think that it's a really awesome hymn but but you've got the whole hymnal to pick from you know when we kind of have to have told People in the congregation that were doing this project, everyone's like, God, now I've got to pick one. <laughs> well, how did you pick this one? Uh, well, I, I actually had emailed you to see if anyone had picked it first, because I assumed that it was a very popular hymn. Um, but I, I have always had a deep love for um, any form of Celtic folk inspired music or folk music in general. Um, I had a phase in my life where uh, all I wanted to do was play uh, fiddle and I just played everything I could get my hands on. Um, huge fan of obviously the, the um, traveling productions, River Dance and Lord of the Dance and those types of things. Um, and so for me, that was always kind of a, a difficult thing to find on organ. And there was not a ton of my love for just the, the rhythms of the fiddle that translated to organ. So this is one of the few instances that I have found. And um, in, in my journeys through life, I have found other Celtic inspired organ pieces. Um, the Outer Hebrides Suite by Paul Halley comes to mind. That is just that is just my baby. I, I love that piece so much and it's just a great opportunity. But um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the bagpipes. Uh, anytime someone gets to do Highland Cathedral, I will cry. Um, it's, it's, well, it's just something that tugs on my heartstrings, I think, oh. in a way that other music doesn't always. Well, and speak, God, I'm so glad you brought up Highland Cathedral because have you had the chance to be the organ accompaniment for that someday? Someday when we get to have nice things again, and we get to all be in the same place again, ooh, we got to make sure that you're the one who gets to, because when, when the organ comes in with those, with those chords oh. under the back, I die every time. Every time. Uh, it's just, it's just too good. It's just well, too good. And, and just, I mean, the, the bagpipes, the rhythms, just something about the melodies of, of, Celtic folk music and music that's inspired by that. Um, even, I, I think that's what pulls me to just Anglican choral repertoire in general. There's, there's just something in kind of the music from the Isles that just, <laughs> it just is something that's different um, from French music or German music. Um, I, I'm a big believer that um, organ pipes and organ music and just national styles follow um, language patterns. Um, I think a lot of people draw parallels to that in um, maybe uh, rhythms and things like that, but I think the, the sound of the pipes actually mimics the vowels of, of, of the different national styles and for whatever That's reason, so fascinating. I just, 
it's, it's that area for me. Um, I had the privilege to travel with my high school choir. Um, we would go on a tour every year and every four years we would uh, leap across the pond. And so we've been to Scotland and Ireland and um, I had the, the uh, great fortune to go back several times as a college leader and then to lead the group myself um, prior to this, this appointment. And um, I've been to Iona several times and there's just a magical, magical, um, there's something in the air. I, you know, I know in Celtic theology, they really talk about thin places, but. Um, you know, an interesting thing about that, I recently learned that uh, that is actually a very new idea. <laughs> Uh, that it, it's something that gets passed around, um, kind of, uh, people who, people who talk about Celtic theology and, like, may or may not actually be from the places where that has grown up. Um, there's not a lot of textual evidence for the idea of thin places until the late 19th century, when people are very obsessed with, like, the veil and spiritualism. Um, and, and the reason that you don't hear about, like, thin places as much in say like the extant sources we have from much earlier and of course god the trick about the middle ages is that we don't have that depending on the era like the early early middle ages they're not called the dark ages because they're backwards they're called dark ages because we don't have anything um but the reason that there was wasn't doesn't seem to have been as much of a concept of a thin place is that there's no separation between the physical and the spiritual it's all integrated as it is, which I think I have only been to Iona once, but I also have been there. And I completely agree. Um, it's, it's that there's something that it's like, it's not the absence of a, of a barrier so much as the full integration of everything. And something that's, that's so fascinating what you say about organ music following linguistic patterns, which I think is so interesting and makes so much sense, because of course you think about that with choral music. Um, you know, something that, that, I mean, I think one of the only things we have in French in our repertoire at the cathedral is uh, Cantique du Jean Racine, but like, I just don't think it works as well in English. The vowels don't work the same, especially in French poetry when you have all of those like voiced E's at the end. Um, but there's, there's something about, I think, you know, certainly this hymn tune in particular, but a lot of music from the British Isles, it's like, it's not too happy. It's not like devastatingly sad in it, or, or even like melancholy in the way that I find a lot of French organ music can be. Like you listen to that and you're like, oh, yes, that's very French. The it's most romantic thing we can do is die. <laughs> and then there's death and yes, yeah. No, I, I, I get what you're saying because I, I feel from my from my trips there and it could have been the overwhelming excitement of being there, but um, the rain is different. Rain yes. to me does not feel like the gray oppressive thing that is preventing spring from arriving in Michigan. It just somehow feels softer and like I have more of an appreciation for the gray tones and the green tones and just maybe the absence of sunlight as opposed to this is dreary and oppressive right and summer you know right and I, and, and I, I think I, that that like strange turn of melancholy maybe is what rolls through a lot of the music and it just it just pulls I can't describe it as yeah. other than a pull yeah well and I think something that is, is related to that. It's, it's notable that this tune, so now like thinking about the music and, and that sort of the emotional coloring of the music, this tune gets used for a lot of stuff. Um, there's another hymn in the Episcopal hymnal to the same tune, and then people keep writing stuff to go with slain, which is, is marked out in here as an Irish ballad melody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't date it except to say that it was adapted in this particular version in 1927, it's notoriously hard to date ballad tunes anyway. But, you know, even though we only get three verses here, or four verses for the Presbyterians, like, you can imagine somebody, like, sitting down in a pub or by a fire or something and singing a whole ballad with, like, 15 verses to this tune. And I would be like, yeah, I'd listen to that. Like, you know, and it just kind of rolled on really nicely. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the, the third stanza with the very expressive mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 
I, I think this one just has such a tremendous range as well, which I think is maybe not quite as typical of a folk song, at least not the folk songs we study in music school, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. smaller range and, you know, definitely has a lot of the pentatonic characteristics, but um, it's just, it's just stunning. And I think having those, those beautiful sweeps up, I think that's what makes Ray Fawn Williams music so powerful. And mm -hmm. it just, it just seems to just be something in the water. Right. <laughs> right. All the water that they're surrounded by over there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I like that you mentioned that upward sweep uh, in the third stanza, because especially once you get to heart of my heart or heart of my own heart, depending on which translation you're using, I'm just like, I mean, that's one of those moments where the marriage of, of words and tune is just so perfect because it really makes that part of the phrase stand out. And then you think like, well, what does it mean? I mean, we're speaking to God this way. What does it mean to say that God is the heart of our heart? Like, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's just, it's perfectly married with the music. I mean, singing yeah. it twice, but it's, I, I, I think maybe that's what upsets me most about the change in the hymn text for the 2010 Presbyterian hymnal. It just, you, it's missing something because it's mm -hmm. not the original intended verse and you know even if the verses are cut at least the text is preserved um with its full intended sweep but i feel you know when you have be thou my wisdom O thou my true word i ever with thee now with me lord thou my soul's shelter thou my high tower it just doesn't Somehow, to me, those images don't go together, and maybe it's the rhetorical thoughts have switched because I, you know, in its in its um, original, you know, you get the "Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word," and and you continue to talk about the relationship between the speaker and God, right. um, you know, "Thou and me dwelling, and I with thee one." And then when you get to the third verse, it switches to protection, mm -hmm. and and if you keep, you know, "Be thou my battle shield," together with now my soul shelter rhetorically it's the same idea you yeah. know and because it's a new verse we're allowed to move on to that new idea and, right. and keep it together but, I, but if, if you switch in the middle I feel that somehow it undermines that upward sweep and that you yeah know, right there in the second verse all of a sudden you have this let down mm -hmm. it's like oh how do you get the energy back for verse three and four Right. Why didn't you consult us, people who put together the new Presbyterian hymnal? I can't believe you didn't call. <laughs> they made some Next money. time. I don't want to judge Next time. Them. You know better now. I know you're all listening to this podcast. Uh, I don't want to judge them on this, on the, just this one hymn, but it's a <laughs> hymnal, but Fine, yeah. the, the, the moment that we discovered this, um, at my, at my job in undergrad, I was at a Presbyterian church and I was the, um, assistant organist and I was playing this piece and my boss loves this hymn he was a composer he, Carrie Radcliffe he's actually in the he's in the Episcopal hymnal um he's got a hymn in there um he sings this hymn from memory he sings many of the hymns from memory um so he is singing full voice gets to the second verse just keeps going and the owls are next to him it's very dutifully reading the hymnal and he rips it out of her hand and you can see him from across the church just go oh, what and immediately so so you know when when a church gets a new hymnal you get you know everybody had donated their hymnal right so they were going to give them back that you donated this hymnal it's been in service of the church for how many years we're going to give it back so carrie in the middle of be thou my vision when he realizes the versification has changed runs, starts grabbing the boxes, locks them in his office, and gets in a shouting match with the ushers after the service. <laughs> because we couldn't give away the hymnals because we didn't know what else had changed. Because this was the first hymn of the first service with the new hymnal. And it's just, I had read the text and I was sitting there and, and I, you know, I had, I had read it. I was like, this doesn't seem exactly right, but I just never checked it. And then when I realized, it's like, I guess I should have given Carrie a heads up. So I'm very sorry, Carrie. <laughs> but it, it made for it makes for a great story. Yeah, and to be fair, that would have been my reaction too, probably. And I mean, there's already, I feel like when something new comes out, everyone is already primed to be like, well, it's new and I don't like it. Um, so you know, <laughs> I know that it's hard. I feel like in this case we've justified our dislike. 
so. <laughs> you know, if we had started with a different hymn, nobody would have ever known. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Oh, on. well, and it's, I mean, to be fair, the hymnal 1982 is not new, and there are still, as we've demonstrated with MG rants about Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and that's not the only thing in there that I'm like, now why did you do that? Um, but they couldn't have asked me my opinion when they put it together. I wasn't around. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I was going to ask if you, if you had any specific memories associated with this hymn, but actually that's it. That's a great memory. Yes. Well, and I, I have some memories with, with the pedal line. So, uh, as an organist, you always play the bass line with your feet. And, um, this one is particularly mobile. Um, so I, I remember this being one of the first hymns where I really had such a very involved pedal part, but it was on my, it was my bucket list. I was gonna learn it. Um, and you know, once it's, once it's in your body, it just, it just flows in a beautiful way. And it just, it just feels really nice under the hands and under the feet. And, um, when you're first learning it, not so much, but after you get well, there. Interestingly, just... all of the, um, all of my favorite choral anthems that now, you know, I have internalized in a very physical way. Uh, I was very annoyed by when I had to learn them. Uh, my soul, there is a country. There I was working on all of those, you know, soprano jumps and all of those phrases that you can't breathe in the middle of. And I was like, God, who is that? Perry? I think that's, I think that's Perry. I don't remember now. It's either Perry or Stanford. But, you know, there I am at the, at the piano going, yeah, yeah. and now you can pry it from my cold, dead hands. It's one of my favorite anthems. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's something that we're all not to be like too sad about COVID on Maine, but wh why leave it in the background when we're all here? Um, something that I miss so much about making music with other people right now is that physical part of it. You know, there's something about, I mean, mostly I stay inside, you know, for safety and I don't live in a place that's very big. So physically, I walk around my apartment and that's kind of it and I you know I miss being able to go and stand in a in a room with other people and you know all like we all immediately stand up straighter <laughs> you know when we are in those choir stalls um and I'm I'm sure you miss it and I'm sure that a lot of people miss it and that's true with with all sorts of you know music making not just singing you know the organ of course is also incredibly physical but yeah 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 the, uh, my, my quarantine project when we initially got shut down, um, was actually to go through the 1982 hymnal just on the piano. Cause I, um, I have an organ in my apartment now. Um, I have a practice organ that, um, my parents purchased when I was a wee young organist. Um, and it has moved here to assist me in completing my doctorate, but, um, and taken away a great amount of floor space. But, uh, when, when COVID first hit, um, all I had was a piano and, um, it was really, it was really hard and very disappointing as it was for everybody. And all I wanted to do was play hymns. I have no idea. Why, I still don't know why I did not sing with them. I just played them. And I did, I went through the 1982 page by page. Didn't make it all the way through. Um, but I, I, I would sit for, I would sit for 30 minutes on Sundays and just, just play through hymns, not just, not singing, just, just wanting to feel those patterns back back in my hands and, and back in my body and I skipped this one because it just wasn't the same. Yeah it's that's very interesting that you say that because actually um the same thing happened to me. My parent I was I was living with my parents at the time. Um I had sort of f forcibly moved home from grad school about three months earlier than I planned because I was I was here I was back in Detroit from spring break from school in Boston and then things shut down and I was like well I guess I'm just not going back to Boston. Um, and, uh, and I didn't, I retrieved my belongings in June and that was it. But, uh, there was a piano at my parents' house. Um, I <laughs> took piano lessons for an embarrassing number of years when I was a child, given how uh, poorly I play. Um, truly every, every like heroine in 19th century literature who's like, oh, I only play the piano like passing well. Like I think Jane Eyre is like, I play the piano a little bit. And Mr. Rochester's like, you're being modest. And then she starts to play. And he's like, actually, no, you're not. You really do only play a little bit. <laughs> That's me. I can, I can read the music. And just because I was an impatient child, so I didn't develop good uh, practicing habits. But this is a very long way of saying I can 
technically sort of play. And so I asked my dad to bring home the, the two volume, you know, accompaniment um, from his office. And he did. Uh, and so my poor, poor patient parents listening to me plunk out. And it's like Lent. So I'm like, where are all the sad ones? You know, <laughs> so I'm, I'm um, oh, what did I do? I did a bit of Jesus, all my gladness. And, um, oh, I don't remember. I don't, I think I tried, um, oh God, the titles are all flying out of my head now. Um, but like some good solid, like Holy Week sad things. Also because we didn't know what we were going to do for Holy Week worship. So I was like, I'll play my own all glory, laud and honor if I have to. Um, it didn't well i also don't have very big hands um but uh the tenor, I, it's it's very interesting that you know we both kind of went to that place of like we just want you know i don't know something like that something comforting and familiar and mm -hmm. beautiful in its simplicity and i think also the knowledge that other people, you know, who are dead now have turned to those same, like, I think I played a lot of how firm a foundation, mm. you know, like, right when we went into lockdown, um, which is such a barnstormer of a hymn. That's so great. And it's really fun to bang out. Oh, yeah. I actually did practice that one enough that I got pretty good at it. Um, but, uh, but that's from the 19th century like the early-ish 19th century, I think. And so thinking about everybody who's like stood in a church gallery booming out how firm a foundation for hundreds of years, oh, yeah. you know, very meaningful. Or, or slain, yeah. you know, this one. Too. This one will be almost 100 years old. Yeah. I mean, the music, yeah. the music is 1927. So. Yeah, yeah, at least the way it's it's presently been adapted. I really, like I said, I I'm, would be very interested. I did not do a lot of, like, in-depth research. Uh, I would be interested to see how well we've been able to date Slain. Um, like I said, a lot of times it's, it's tricky to date the, you know, okay, this tune has been around in one form or another uh, for ballads, but yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a good one. Thank you for coming to talk about it with us. Is there anything else you want to say that we might have missed? It's a really good hymn. It's a really good hymn! And we're all looking forward to the day when we can be in the same place and sing it again together safely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we will say good night then, I think. I don't know. When you are, are watching or listening to this, dear, dear listener, it's rather late. Where we are so i i think we're ready to to wrap our days up but uh thank you so much for watching if you're on youtube listening if you're listening through the podcast um you can find us on uh all sorts of social media we're on facebook we're on instagram uh if you go to our instagram st paul's detroit that's st paul's no apostrophe detroit uh there is a link on our instagram profile that has links to all the rest of our social media, so I'm not going to run through all of those now, um, but our website is DetroitCathedral.org. Uh, you can go there, you can check out our services, you can see what's coming up, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, and again, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye, Sarah. Bye.